the grandest battles in history are often between fact and fiction. This is a dramatization of two fakes that shook the world. A radio play that convinced America the Martians were invading and the publication of the diaries of Adolf Hitler, the biggest gamble in the history of journalism. It is October the 30th, 1938. In Europe, Adolf Hitler has just invaded Czechoslovakia. In Britain, the world's first radar system begins full operation. In America, the House Un-American Activities Committee is established to investigate behavior deemed alien to the American way. The United States of America is listening to the radio. It's the day before Halloween. The makers of Jason Sanborn Ten million radio sets have been sold since last year. And your host, Don radio is a phenomenon. A source of live news coverage. It's a terrific race, last year, it brought listeners live reports of President Roosevelt's second inaugural speech and the Hindenburg airship disaster. Right, from the top. At a radio studio in New York, Howard Koch, a 35-year-old lawyer turned playwright, is feverishly completing the rewrites for a play he has been working on for the last six days. While he reads it, let me remind you that we are speaking... The to deadline the is looming. New Jersey. While Kosh works, actors, technicians and musicians around him are rehearsing. So you need to they have only 30 minutes until their live broadcast. But their 23-year-old director and star is still not happy with script or performance. Okay. All right, we're going to take this from the top. And... This is the Mercury the Theatre right? on the air. From the top. From the top. Just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Someone has just handed... Professor the company was created last year by the 36-year-old producer, John Houseman. I'm sorry, John. Just let me finish. The more you interrupt me, the longer it's going to take. John, please let him finish. All right, Carl, we're going to take... And a brilliant... Writer, director, actor from Wisconsin, Orson Welles. I've never missed anything. All right, Howard. There's only one thing about this monologue. I think you have too many synonyms for the alien craft. It should just be a thing. All right, Frank. One more time from the top. Yet to be a famous name, Welles is already turning heads in the theatrical world. He has been writing and directing from the age of ten. Both his parents had died by the time he was 16, giving the young prodigy a drive and independence that was to see him conquer the New York stage with his Macbeth by the age of 21, only two years ago. Mrs. Delaney, an elderly New Yorker, has just finished her evening meal and is looking forward to listening to the radio. Seventy-seven miles away, Maisie Curtis has just said goodnight to her fiancé. Well, hello, hey, Maisie. Maisie. How was your day? Were you parking? Mind your own. Maisie and her two I sisters feel. settle down to a pleasant evening by the radio. What is this you've dealt me here? It's what you got dealt. Don't look at my car. Okay, uh, in the beginnings of the 20th century, Last week, uh, Wells Company presented Around Pearson. the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. I got the first scene, no, sir. No, 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 scrub that. Maybe the, uh, the Martians, this week, I don't know. In have, 10 have you got that? time, they will start performing their adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Within two hours, 
Orson Welles will be a household name. Published in England 40 years ago, the science fiction fantasy describes how an alien invasion destroys most of Surrey and parts of London before a bacteria finally kills off the Martian invaders. The novelist H.G. Wells, now 72, sold the US radio rights to Orson Welles earlier this year. No, no, faster, just a little bit Howard faster. Howard Koch has been working for the Mercury Theatre for a month. The young writer is paid $75 a week, a sum Wells and Houseman have balked at. From the top, please. To supplement the meagre wage, Koch has managed to claim the copyright in all his scripts. Presented with this project last weekend, he is worried. I realized I could use practically nothing but the author's idea of a Martian invasion and his description of their appearance and their machines. In short, I was being asked to do an almost entirely original hour-length play in six days. See, I got the bit about The six days before the broadcast were a nightmare of scenes written and rewritten and between frantic phone calls and pages speeding back and forth to the okay, studio and all the while that Sunday deadline staring me in the face. Sure, yeah. Yeah, no, Last great. Tuesday, only five nights before the broadcast tonight, Kosh and his secretary, Anne Froelich, worked through the it's night. Okay. It's okay. It's yeah? Uh, moving slowly, but yeah, we'll get it. Well, uh, yeah, we'll speed it up a bit. When I finally got there, around two in the morning, things were better. They were beginning to have fun, laying waste to the state of New Jersey. Wednesday at sunrise, the script was finished. How's Orson? He's okay. Orson's okay. A little anxious that we need to get this ready, though. And John Howard. Three days ago, Wells saw the script for the first time. It's just not right. I, I, there's a lot of good stuff he made a radical suggestion. The story should be presented as a series of news flashes. I want this to be like, like a news broadcast, like the Hindenburg disaster. I want this to be people confused, not sure what's going to happen. Sure, it's just we got three days to do this, Orson. Well, Wells realized radio had become the voice of unchallengeable truth. makes it work. There should be... Like we had a lot of radio nuts on as commentators at this period. People who wanted to keep us out of European entanglements. And a fascist priest called Father Coughlin. And people believed everything they heard on the radio. Are you with me? Sure. Orson has been working on the show since noon. This morning, he was rehearsing his stage production of Danton's Death. He is eager to complete War of the Worlds and to get back to rehearsing tonight. As usual, he drinks a flagon of pineapple juice and prepares for the start. Mrs. Delaney tunes into the NBC network for The Chase and Sanborn Hour, a mixture of music and comedy from Eddie Bergen and his ventriloquist dummy, Charlie McCarthy. While he reads it, let me remind you that we are speaking to you from the observatory. Davidson Taylor, the CBS executive in charge of Welder's show, is nervous. He is still not convinced War of the Worlds is anything but an audience loser. That's not good, John. Hey, John, I'm worried. Mercury Theatre on the Air is struggling only ever getting 4% of the listening audience. Their competitor in this slot, the Chase and Sanborn R, averages 37%. Wait, 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 oh, God. Maisie Curtis and her family are happy to be free of the usual dire news from Europe. In the last weeks, listeners have followed the rising threat of Nazism. Only four weeks ago, Adolf Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia, and America is bracing itself for war. This evening, all is calm. So far. 8 p.m. The show begins. 
The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Exhausted, Kosh heads for home. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theatre and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We now know that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's. And yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busy themselves about their various concerns... Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental So far, Radio News. the broadcast has made it clear that this is fiction. But most radio listeners have been tuned into other channels, like NBC's Chase and Sanborn Hour. The comedy has finished for the moment, and Nelson Eddy is singing. This is usually the time people like to start channel hopping for something new. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel situated in downtown New York. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna ask For the next seven minutes, listeners start turning their dials. And now a tune that never loses favor. The ever popular Stardust, Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. The War of the Worlds now takes the form of a program of dance music provided by the studio orchestra in various guises constantly interrupted by news flashes. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. As more and more listeners switch over to War of the Worlds, Wells's usual audience of two million grows to over six, listening avidly as the Mercury Theatre describes a disturbance on Mars. Most listeners have no idea they are listening to actors. Everything okay? Orson Welles is now introduced as Professor Pearson, an astronomer. I'd say the chances against it are a thousand to one. Uh, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Someone has just handed Professor Pearson a message. While he reads it, let me remind you that we, we are speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where we are interviewing the world-famous astronomer Professor Pearson. 92 stations are relaying Wells's drama across the whole of the United States. And more and more people are joining Mrs. Delaney, Maisie and her family, glued to their radios as the ominous meteor lands on Earth. From American Observatory. Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. Paul, what's going on? It is reported that at 8.50 p.m. a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. On Monday last week, Howard Koch had been driving along the Hudson River on his day off. He pulled into a gas station and bought a map of New Jersey. He needed to find a place for the first Martian ship to land. Back in New York, starting to work, I spread out the map and closed my eyes and put down the pencil point. It happened to fall on Grover's Mill. I like the sound. It had an authentic ring. The CBS censor had not asked for geographic locations to be fictional. Can you hear it now? Uh, Listeners are glued to their radio sets as they hear the reports of a metallic meteor landing only minutes away from their homes. I say, do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? What do you think? The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this earth. Friction with the earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in the meteorite. Wait a minute. Someone's calling someone or something. I 
I can see peering out of that black hole, two l- luminous discs. Now the eyes, it might be a face, might be almost oh, 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 heaven. Something hey, wriggling. Out Within of the ten minutes, the unrest is growing out of proportion. For the people of Grover's Mill, this is the end. The Martians are here. A team of local hunters is dispatched to see off any aliens. And the town's volunteer part-time fire chief spends the next two hours responding to frantic reports of non-existent fires from townsfolk convinced the Martians are attacking. Just one moment, please. At least 40 people, including six state troopers, commanders... We're not going to die. We're going to get out of here. Come on, let's get out of here. Come on, come on. Let's go, honey. I have been requested by the governor of New Jersey to... Place In their panic to escape a Martian death, the couple are losing control. on legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the... The panic grows, and the fear spreads from the east coast to west. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumptions that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmland tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. My wife and I were driving through Northern California when the broadcast came over our car radio. There was no escape. All we could think of was to get back to L.A. to see our children once more. In their panic, the couple don't realize they're running out of gas until their car stutters to a halt. Empty. And trampled to death under the metal we just the sat monster. there holding hands, expecting any minute to see those Martian monsters appear over the tops of the trees. The middle section of New Jersey and has effectively cut the state through its center. Davidson Taylor. Yes. CBS executive Davidson Taylor receives a telephone call. He is informed of the mayhem on the streets of New York and all across the United What's States. The to do with this? this is the first time anyone at the studio has any idea what is happening outside. Oh, you're joking. You can't be serious. This is Newark, New Jersey. This is Newark, New Jersey. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. <laughs> Girls, wait. Mom, where are you going? Huh? Huh? Automobile seven. 23, 24. Maisie and her family are desperate. Like so many people across the country now, her father calls on his faith to get them through the crisis. Mrs. Delaney is also praying. Hearing Wells describing the poisonous Martian gas, she decides to make her room airtight with wet towels. My plan? was to stay in my room and hope I wouldn't suffocate before the gas blew away. By now, over a million people are panicking by their radios and spreading the panic to their neighbors. Taylor is aware that the CBS switchboard is jammed with calls and that the New York police want to shut the play down. He orders an announcement to be made. listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. The performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Despite three similar announcements, it is too late. Police find families huddled in streets in New York. Hysteria has even led to some reported sightings of the alien machines. A terrified woman phones the Trenton police, screaming, you can't imagine the horror of it. It's hell. By this point, only Wells's character and a stranger he has met survive. There are seven minutes till the end of the broadcast. Well, after parting with the artilleryman, I came at last to the Holland Tunnel, entered that silent tube anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. 
20 families evacuate a tenement block on Hedden Terrace, Newark. Wet flannels across their faces that they hope will deflect the Martian heat rays. St. Michael's Hospital in Newark is treating 15 men and women for shock. The play draws to its end, concluding with the Martians being destroyed by common bacteria. New York police headquarters send out an urgent teletype to all receivers. Station WABC informs us that the broadcast just concluded over that station was a dramatization of a play. No cause for alarm. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen. Out of character, to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. Gentlemen, Back at CBS. The panic continues. Davidson Taylor bundles Wells and Houseman into a small back room where they will remain for an hour. More police have arrived at CBS and hundreds of reporters. Taylor clears the studio of all material relating to the show. Finally let out, Wells makes his way quickly to the Comedy Theatre, New York, for a nighttime rehearsal of Danton's death. They still have no idea of the impact of their Halloween stunt. The next morning, Kosh goes out to his barber and finds a world in shock. Catching ominous snatches of conversation with words like invasion and panic. I jumped to the conclusion that Hitler had invaded some new territory and that the war that we all dreaded had finally broken out. The New York Times gives Kosh the real story. Nine million people heard War of the Worlds. The New York Times had received 875 calls about the Martian invasion. Churches had held services of absolution and callers in Providence asked the local power company to switch the town's lights off so they could hide from the invaders. Accused of being grossly irresponsible, Wells was an overnight sensation. Next day, he apologized, but drew attention to the four times CBS identified War of the Worlds as a fictional play throughout the hour. Asked if he regretted the realistic tone of the work, he said, no, you don't play murder with soft words. News of the panic spread around the world. In Germany, Nazi newspaper Volkische Biobachter blamed a Jewish conspiracy for the mayhem. Six months later, on April the 28th, 1939, Adolf Hitler referred to it while deriding America's criticism of his aggression in Europe. As a result of War of the Worlds, Orson Welles signed a contract with RKO in July 1939 and made his cinematic masterpiece, Citizen Kane. Howard Koch went on to win an Oscar in 1944 for his screenplay for Casablanca. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween. April 1983, 
In France, 41 Soviet diplomats and journalists are expelled for spying. In America, President Reagan has just announced plans for the Star Wars nuclear defense system. In Bolivia, former Nazi Klaus Barbie has been arrested and deported for war crimes. Eight a.m. Saturday, the 23rd of April. Magnus Linklater is an exhausted man. The 41-year-old features editor of the Sunday Times has been working all night, preparing the biggest story of his life. But Linklater needs to make an urgent phone call. And I'll get it done. 60 miles away in Cambridge, the phone is answered by the 69-year-old master of the college. Yes, it is. Known as the noble refrigerator to his colleagues, Hugh Trevor Roper is Britain's most celebrated historian. I see. Four years ago, he was made Lord Dacre of Glanton by the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Yes, yes, I am 100% convinced. In nine hours, right. the newspaper's presses downstairs okay. will be printing the biggest scoop the paper has ever had. OK, bye. Thank you. The publication of the diaries of Adolf Hitler written across the whole period of the Führer's reign between 1933 and 1945. They have never been published before. Surrounded by a mountain of research, Linklater is about to add a major contribution to history. The last 24 hours have been the most dramatic of his life. Yesterday morning, Hugh Trevor Roper completed 3,000 words for the Sunday Times on the discovery of the diaries. Trevor Roper is the leading authority on Hitler and the Third Reich. His authentication of the diaries is the key to their publication and promises to be the pinnacle of his career. A chemist in the Bad Ems Forensic Laboratory, Dr. Arnold Rentz, is completing final testing on an extremely sensitive case. Sworn to secrecy, Rentz has been asked to determine the age of some material from a recently discovered archive of Nazi documents, including two pages allegedly from Hitler's diaries. Cambridge, 9 a.m. A dispatch rider collects Trevor Roper's article, taking it to London and into history. After a week of frantic work, the historian can now relax. Now, don't forget, darling, we leave at four. He's looking forward to his own trip to London this evening to attend the Royal Opera in Covent Garden. Elsewhere, there is absolute conviction in favor of their authenticity. After all, Hugh Trevor Roper is the expert. Flown to Zurich at the request and expense of the Times newspaper group, Trevor Roper had been taken to a vault in the Swiss Handelsbank. His hosts were from Der Stern, a German magazine, who were buying the rights to the 60 volumes. At three in the afternoon, the historian was presented with Hitler's diaries. Three experts had declared the handwriting genuine, but Trevor Roper still expected a wasted trip. When I entered the back room in the Swiss bank and began to turn the pages of those volumes and learn the extraordinary story of their discovery, my doubts gradually dissolved. At first glance, the diaries promised extraordinary insights. The Führer refers to SS leader Heinrich Himmler as 
this deceitful small animal breeder and complains that the little Dr. Goebbels is up to his old tricks again with women. On the conduct of the war in 1940, Hitler squirms, saying, the English are worrying me. Shall I let them go or not? How will Churchill react? Trevor Roper knew he had a very limited time to examine the books. Each carried the official red wax seal of the Third Reich and had a label declaring them to be the Fuhrer's property. But Trevor Roper was not fluent in German and he failed to notice that Hitler's initials on the covers were not in fact A.H. but F.H. He signed a confidentiality pledge and immediately confirmed authenticity to the Times. Thank you. Uh... A day later, the new owner of Times newspapers, Rupert Murdoch, entered a bidding war to buy the rights to the diaries. Three days ago, on the 19th of April, Murdoch agreed to pay $1.2 million for the British and American rights. Publication would follow this weekend. Noon. Dr. Rents types his report on the material he has tested. Though the diary pages could be the right age, he has only been able to inspect two and would not swear to authenticity. Two days before this week's paper is out, the lead story of the Sunday Times is yet to be decided. But the exasperated editor of the paper, Magnus Linklater's boss, is about to make an announcement. We start doing Hitler's diaries at the next edition. That's all the times we get. We haven't got enough time to do our own work on this. I know, I know. I don't want to hear any more about that. The deal's been signed and we're going to do it. Linklater is convinced they're heading for a fall. Four months ago, before Christmas, Linklater had been notified about the existence of the diaries by right-wing historian David Irving. It appeared the diaries were part of a huge Third Reich archive. The discovery of a German journalist, Gerd Heidemann. After further investigation, Irving concluded Heidemann was unreliable and that the whole collection was dangerously polluted with fakes. Linklater steered clear. The Berlin Wall divides Germany at this time, with East Germany controlled by the Soviet Union. There is a vibrant trade in Nazi memorabilia, but only through the secretive channels of the black market. The Soviet East German government has banned the export of artifacts made before 1945. With no chance for official checks, the number of forgeries is vast and uncontrolled. But the German magazine is at this very moment facing a warning. In Koblenz, Dr. Renz gives another forensic scientist his worrying conclusions. Keen to push ahead with the scoop, de Stern has agreed to further tests. But they won't happen until after German publication begins on Monday. Auf Wiedersehen. Only the journalist Gerd Heidemann, who has received over five million Deutschmarks to purchase the diaries, knows of their source. De Stern invites the world's media to a massive press launch on Monday. The forensic results are not relayed to Rupert Murdoch in London. Meanwhile, three miles away at the Sunday Times, Linklater and his team have received a dossier of translated copies from the diaries. As I sat down to read the intimate jottings of the Nazi leader, we were, in a sense, 
dealing with history in the raw. Here in this folder, we would learn at first hand whether Hitler had indeed formulated the final solution. Instead of bristling rhetoric and revelation, Linklater is confronted with dull meanderings and trite, ordinary records. Oh, look at that. We thought it was more like Peter Sellers doing a poor impersonation than an insight into the mind of the Fuhrer. The diary entries are childish and simplistic. Hitler writes off the 1944 assassination attempt on his life with, ha ha, isn't it laughable? This scum, these loafers and good-for-nothings. These people were bunglers. And of Himmler, he petulantly says, I will show this unfathomable little penny-pincher with his lust for power what I am really like. A tough night is ahead. Linklater's epic task begins with the story behind the diaries themselves. 20th of April, 1945. Adolf Hitler's 56th birthday. Germany was almost defeated and the Russians were close to Berlin. The Führer ordered his staff to pack up his own possessions for safe removal from Berlin to Bavaria. Ten planes flew out of Berlin that night, carrying personal records belonging to the Führer. One of the planes was shot down on the treacherous journey, crashing and exploding in Bonnersdorf near Dresden. In that plane were all my private archives that I had intended as a testimony for posterity. It is a catastrophe, stormed Adolf Hitler. Nine days later, the Führer committed suicide. In 1982, Gert Heidemann declared that Hitler's diaries had survived, languishing in a hay barn for 37 years. There was no explanation as to why they had never been revealed before or how they survived the burning plane back in 1945. There had been no forensic evidence. No surviving Nazi had ever mentioned Hitler keeping a diary. And in fact, it was understood Adolf Hitler hated writing by hand. The palsy he suffered as a result of Parkinson's disease would have made writing physically uncomfortable for the Führer. Trevor Roper is suddenly questioning why no German academic has been allowed to see the material. He is also wondering how the 60 volumes could have reappeared so suddenly. The historian is panicking. His reputation now rests entirely on his authentication of the diaries. Magnus Linklater is also worried. The Sunday headline on the front of the paper will read, The Secrets of Hitler's War, and eight columns will cover the front page with the sensation. James, I need that copy on my desk in five, okay? Linklater's team have nearly finished the piece. Put more colour in the Rudolf Hess pass. Ten minutes. Yeah. Ten minutes, okay? Okay. The front page reads, historians and commentators were sharply divided between those who were ready to believe the diaries were the biggest discovery since the Dead Sea Scrolls and those who considered the collection to be a massive forgery. Everything rests on the authentication of the paper's key expert, Q. Trevor Roper. Nine hours before the presses start printing tomorrow's paper, and the world awaits the greatest exclusive the Sunday Times has ever had. Today's edition of the Times carries Hugh Trevor Roper's essay of endorsement, and the chance to halt tomorrow's publication of the diaries is rapidly disappearing. 
And I'll get it done. Hello? Hello, yes, uh, Lord Dacre. Magnus Linklater it's wants to hear for himself that his task has not been in vain. Oh, yeah, I'm really sorry to call you so early, but... Um, Trevor Roper refuses to, to admit his growing fears to a junior editor. I know we've gone over this a thousand times, but... Are you sure of the authenticity of the diaries? Yes, yes, I am 100% convinced. Or, or put it this way, I'm 99.9% .9 convinced. Right. Magnus Linklater will soon realise the vast difference between 100% and 99.9%. .9 OK, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Mm. Hugh Trevor is convinced he has made a fool of himself. He picks up the Morning Times to be confronted with his authentication essays spread across six columns. My dear? <clears throat> his gloom and embarrassment deepen. The hitherto accepted idea that after his release from prison he had stopped writing by hand is a myth. In fact, we must envisage him every night after he had apparently gone to bed sitting down to write his daily record. Clear-sighted though he could be, Hitler was never one to yield to inconvenient evidence. Magnus Linklater has heard the authentication with his own ears. He starts to relax. In spite of previous anxieties, he and his team are delighted with the craftsmanship of their work. Uh, change the last three pars on this. I think Last minute changes are discussed with Philip Knightley and the job is almost done. Fine. 8.30 a.m. Hugh Trevor Roper is desperate to stop the Sunday Times printing the diaries. No, well, well, where is it, you know? I need to speak to him most urgently. Well, I see. Thank you. Instead of contacting Linklater direct, he calls Charles Douglas Hume, the editor of the Times. Charles, uh, it's, it's, it's Dacre. It's about the Hitler diaries. I've decided that I'm going to have to withdraw my validation. What? Well, I've decided I have to do it. Uh, For some reason, Douglas Hume never passes on the message to the Sunday Times. For the next 10 hours, the newspaper will push on towards its ultimate humiliation. Yes. Thank you, Charles. The presses downstairs are printing 1.4 million copies of tomorrow's edition of the Sunday Times. The Secrets of Hitler's War is a headline none of them will ever forget. The first copies have been sent up to the editorial office. This is the moment of triumph, in spite of the cynical reports from other newspapers that the diaries are fake. <laughs> They're all gonna jump up and down on that bloody question. Christ, let them! <laughs> we could splash this for weeks. Joining Frank Giles for a celebration drink, Linklater and Knightley are aware of the challenge from other papers. We could get Dacre on it again. That's a good idea. Firm things up. Could work. Next week, a rebuttal in black and white. Frank Giles decides to phone their key expert, the man who has made publication possible and reliable. Hello, Hugh. Ah, oh, it's Frank here. Yeah, yeah. Look, the Observer are doing a piece on this uh, authenticity angle. And I just uh, wondered if you'd like to do a scholarly detail piece, Re rebutting. What was that, Hugh? Yeah, I, I know, Hugh. We, uh, we, we all have our doubts from time to time. Oh, but Hugh, uh, surely your doubts are not uh, strong enough to make you do a complete 180 degree turnabout. Oh, I see. You are doing a 180 degree 
turnabout. Q Trevoropa is the linchpin of their scoop. Trevor Roper feels happier now. He has made an honest statement and will stick to it. He has been invited by De Stern to attend their launch on Monday. He decides to make a clean break and tell the world his fears. Well, I shouldn't worry about it anymore, my dear. You've done the right thing. That's what it matters. At the Sunday Times, the bad news is being relayed to Rupert Murdoch. Murdoch says, publish. When the Sunday Times appeared the next day, circulation went up by 60,000. At the Duchstern press conference in Berlin on Monday, Trevor Roper claimed the diaries could not be authenticated and that he was not supporting the publication. It was the beginning of the end. The Sunday Times would not print anything more of the diaries. Almost two weeks later, the final forensic tests were completed in Wiesbaden and Berlin establishing what Dr. Renz had suggested almost a month ago. The paper in the diaries was laced with a chemical whitener that had not existed before 1955. The seals on the front of the diaries contained polyester, and the ink was not more than 12 months old. The Führer's inaccurate initials were cheap plastic. The forgery was confirmed. They were fakes. Within three weeks, a 45-year-old East German art forger, Konrad Kujau, admitted he had written all the diaries five years ago and had sold them with Gert Heidemann to De Stern. Both men were sent to prison for fraud in July 1985. Within a month, the reputation of the Sunday Times was in ruins, and in June, editor Frank Giles was fired by Rupert Murdoch. Magnus Linklater survived the embarrassment, eventually moving on to edit the Scotsman newspaper. Hugh Trevor Roper was a laughing stock. Plagued by the press, the peer was later forced to admit publicly, it was my fault. Trevor Roper remained the master of Peterhouse College in Cambridge for another four years and died in 2003. His reputation was never restored. Adolf Hitler remains the most mysterious and demonized figure of the 20th century. Though more than a thousand books have been written about the dictator, the world has no record of the day-to-day -day thoughts of the mind that ruled Germany for 12 years, instigated the Holocaust, and started a war that led to 56 million deaths.